Hello, this is Karen Lopez. You may know me from my snarky tweets on Twitter as DataCheck, or as my witty blog posts at datamodel.com, or perhaps you know me from appearances at other CTO advisor events. I'm a Microsoft MVP in data platform, a V-expert. I also enjoy being a NASA data knot, and by the way, I'm a data chick because I was born that way. You can follow me on Twitter, friend me on Facebook, link with me or LinkedIn, but no matter what you do, make sure that you love your data. One note about this presentation. Since this is about some of my thoughts on data, it's going to be a little bit eclectic, but not weird. I promise you, there'll be no weird. So let's talk about thinking about data. Why this topic? Data is perceived as being an old school technology. I mean, it's none of that sexy software stuff. And by old, I just mean it's very experienced like me. People get caught up on the fact that technology is sexy and data might be less so. But I told you I was born this way as a data lover, but I think data is why we do the most of IT. Data is everything and everything is data. What do I mean by this? As the advent of software-defined services, as virtualization becomes the norm of how we do things, it seems like data is involved with most of it. And I'm a data chick, so I'm a bit biased. But I'm here to tell you that all data is suffering. Let's talk about why I think that if I'm such a fan of data. Well, one of the noble truths about data being suffering is that we suffer when we want reality to be different than it is. That's what causes suffering. And so many times we expect our data to be there, to be of good quality, to have integrity, to be available when we want it to, and yet it isn't always that way. The reason it's not that way is that we haven't put in place the things to make sure our data has integrity and quality and protection and availability. All data is suffering also because the world is much more complex than any one person sees. All data is suffering also because we don't always do the right things or take the right path in order to make sure that it delivers to us what we need from it. In this highly complex data model, which by the way, only covers in-store retail processes, you can see the complexity there and how everything is linked to every other thing, or at least it seems that way. My job as a data architect is to help decide what goes in what box, how things should be related, how they shouldn't be related, what constraints we should have on that data, how do we know whether the data is right, what standards are we using to measure against it. All of those things are part of my day-to-day -day job. I'm here to tell you that I don't believe things are software defined. I think it's more like they're data defined. Think of those things that you think of with software defined. Well, there's a configuration, there's desired states for them, there's relationships between all the components, and there's permissions and a bunch of other complexity that we need to define. But is software defining that? Or do we have a whole slew of XML and JSON files and Jupyter notebooks and all of those things holding the configurations, the desired states, the relationships, the security, and the logic that ties them all together? I'd like to see you all using the term data defined, but I know you really like the software defined thing because most people think software is the reason we have information technology. Another thought about data is that one person's data is another person's metadata. So the typical definition of metadata is data about data, but we've expanded that in the world to mean properties or configurations or characteristics about something. And yes, that's exposed as data, and it might be also some software, meaning some scripts or some logic in there. In the data architecture world, we talk about a lookup table. We say it's just a lookup table. Who cares how it's designed? Well, that one little lookup table, let's say a list of countries and states, is another person's full-blown data. So you're just a lookup table or just a configuration or just a parameters file. That's somebody's data. Another key aspect in thinking about data is data lasts longer than code. As a very experienced data architect, there are systems that I know the data existed before I did, and it'll exist long before I'm gone from this planet. The other thing, especially with the advent of big data, 
is more data doesn't always mean better data. Sometimes more data is just more data. How do you spot a data professional in the wild? Well, there are the traditional data roles, data architect, database administrator, data scientist, data miner, data modeler, data steward, data governance professional. All of those, you can kind of tell they're data professions because they've got that word in there. But some of the other data professionals, there are the C-level people, the CIOs, the chief data officers, the chief, chief knowledge officers, the data center guy, the data moonlighter. But what about these folks? Are DevOps analysts and DevOps engineers data people? Are developers data people? How about the network people or the data center people or the storage people? Of course they are because they're all managing data. They may not realize they're database administrators as they produce all those JSON files and check them into GitHub, but they're data people and GitHub is their database. This is what we need to know. Just because the data is stored in a non-traditional format doesn't mean it's not data. Let's also look at how these people fall on a matrix that goes from supports data to uses data. You'd be shocked maybe to know that a data modeler supports data by creating data models, but they don't really interact with the data that much themselves. And DBAs especially, like data to a DBA, is really a database or maybe a database instance or server. The data center, storage, and infrastructure people, their data, the way they talk about it, is sometimes hardware. So they talk about data protection. Maybe that just means backups to them. But to me, data protection also means security and data quality and data integrity and data availability. So you might think about where your title or where your role fits among supporting data or data technologies and using actual data. The other thing that makes a big difference in data engineers and professionals is this kind of conflicting viewpoint between transactional and analytical data users. These are very different worlds. In fact, a traditional uh, relational transactional data modeler often finds a hard time making a transition to being a data warehouse data modeler. I'm one of those people. These people have different points of view. One is about preserving the integrity of the data. That's why transactional systems are highly normalized so that we don't have update anomalies. That's why analytical systems are highly denormalized because they're optimized for performance because the data integrity was in theory already done at the transaction or the capture time. These two groups of people have different needs, they have different rewards and different skill sets. Much like the difference between someone who builds rockets and someone who flies on them. There's a lot of hyper buzzwords in the data world. Now all these are legitimate data approaches or methods or tools, but they're being abused all over the place. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science, data virtualization, and the all important algorithm. I think it's our job as IT professionals to make sure that when someone says our product uses artificial intelligence, our next question should be, hey, tell me about that artificial intelligence. Tell me how you do it. What algorithms are you using? What tools are you using? Same for machine learning. It's a common understanding that some people think a bunch of if statements categorize machine learning. And data science, besides the fact that data science is the sexiest job on the planet and pays really well, a lot of people think if you work with data, you're a data scientist. Some other ones, big data, that one's already sort of falling off the hype cycle, but I see big data as a reason to not treat data well. And if you're building a transactional system and it's not big data, high volume, high velocity, then perhaps you shouldn't be using big data technologies for them. NoSQL has been through all this. I think the fight between relational and non-relational data solutions has sort of fallen out to, we'll just use the best tool for our data story. That makes me happy. Schemaless is also a funny one that comes from the NoSQL world because most of the NoSQL solutions actually have a schema. They might implement it differently, 
but they have one. They have a structure to the data. There's an understanding of the data. The difference is that structure might be applied after the data is read, not when it's being written. And then we have the whole code-driven data things. There have been along my 30 plus years of experience, lots of technologies where people are saying that we no longer need to design data. We'll just let the code generate it. Well, I'm here to tell you that that means that the developer writing the code is also being the data architect and they are being measured, rewarded and promoted based on how fast they get code written not how well they protect the data or preserve its integrity. This is a natural conflict of interest that comes about through our reward mechanisms that come down from management. So a code-driven data structure is one that says this data only exists for this piece of code. That may not be the cost benefit and risk trade-off that you want for all of your data. Some data words that are newish in the overall scheme of data management Data controllers and processes, which arose out of the privacy legislation, these are people that either steward the data in the term data controller, or they're an, a third party that processes the data. Data governance is a huge issue right now, and it's going through a lot of growing pains. Is this some large multi-departmental um, policing of data properties, or is it a way of identifying the processes that make data better? Data stewards are people who curate data standards and curate data policies. They often work with people like me, data architects. Data sovereignty is the location of the data and what legislation or compliance or policies are required for data that either resides in a particular location or passes through it. Data models have been around forever. What's different about data models now is they're not just relational data models, entity relationship diagrams. There's graph data models, there's document data models. A data model is still important, and I'm here to tell you an ERD isn't always the most appropriate one. Metadata we already talked about. Data lakes, swamps, oceans, all of these terms for bringing together a whole lot of data, not worrying about overly restricting or curating it and providing it to make it available to all kinds of other people within the organization. Data estate is a very buzzy word that has been used to talk about anything from hardware to software to data centers to databases to data models and data gravity. Data gravity says that the larger data becomes, the more mass it has, the more likely you are to bring compute to the data than you are to carry data to the compute. Some data truths. Let's start with the positive. Data people can be a bit snarky. I'm one of those people. And one of the reasons why I'm snarky is I've been doing this data stuff for more than 30 years. I'm very experienced at it. I'm also very old and that makes me kind of a curmudgeon about all of this. But I also find that it means that I've been through a lot of innovation around data technologies, and I definitely know the benefits of innovating in the data space. But I also want to make sure that we don't forget about the fundamental truths of data. I don't see data as a byproduct of software, yet so many people do. We fund projects where data is a byproduct of an application project or a software acquisition project. Data that's treated this way often is biased toward the application. And when that application or solution is replaced, the expense of migrating to a new solution is significant. I see data as the reason we even have software. Now, this is definitely a conflicting point of view with a lot of software professionals. I'm just acknowledging this difference. I also think that all data has value, even data just for now. So data just for now, that could be logs, that could be configurations in a JSON file that are just going to be used for migrating this one project once. I still want to apply the data integrity rules to make sure that we get the results we want. I believe that data quality is a measure, not a grade. High data quality to me means that we've measured the data we have against a previous standard that we've published. 
Low data quality would be data that doesn't meet the standard we expected. But if the standard we posted was it doesn't have to be consistent on read, we don't really care whether data is missing, we don't really care if there are invalid values, then the data has the quality we want, and that's high quality. On the other hand, if the data is for my bank account and I have standards, both accounting standards, bank standards, and my own standards for its integrity and quality, and it doesn't meet that, I'm going to call that low quality. So we need to measure data against a standard, report the quality of the data by measuring it to that standard. And the implication for this is, if you don't have a standard, your data quality can be anything you say it is. I mentioned this before, data lasts longer than code. Sure, there's plenty of systems where the data comes in, it's processed, it's analyzed, and it's deleted. But I've worked with data, especially things like address and location data that's more than 100 years old, sometimes more than 200 years old. That data has been collected, has been curated for all of those years across dozens and dozens of professionals who were responsible for its integrity and quality and I can use it because it was treated well. Even COBOL isn't as old as a lot of the data that's still being used. Data deserves our protection for future users because of this. So if we overly optimize our data to meet one application developer's priorities, we're definitely going to sacrifice the benefit we can get for it for future users of that data. So let's look at not just the truths. Well, these aren't lies. I'm going to talk about lies. But the first thing I want you to know is that data is weird because people are weird. I know this is a shock to you. And systems are weird. I know also a shock. People lie and our data ends up impacted by this. So let's look at this number. In 1980s, 7 million children disappeared off the face of the earth. Just boom, on one day. So I'll let you ponder that for a second. But I'll give you a hint. This happened on April 15th. In 1987, when the IRS started requiring Social Security numbers for children aged 5 or over, on April 15th of that year, when the taxes were filed, 7 million children, dependents really, disappeared off the face of the earth. And that was because prior to 1987, all you had to do was write down names of children. Let's just say that people weren't lying that they had extra children. It probably just felt that way to the parents. But we know in 87, they all disappeared and it never even made the news. That cost Americans $2.8 billion in what appears to be people fudging data in order to benefit from it. In this example, I'll let you look at this number and let you guess what you think it is. If you're in the US, you'll probably guess right away. This is a number I use when US-based companies ask me for a piece of information that doesn't apply to me, namely a zip code. Why don't I give something more popular like 90210 from the TV series? Well, that's because this zip code is from Hell, Michigan. Because the way I figure it, if I'm going to have to give bad data in order to buy something from you, you might as well know what I think of it. Here's a Canadian example. In this particular postal code, H0H0H0, this is a postal code for someone really important in Canada. But people tend to give it when they don't want to give their truthful postal code. And that's because this postal code belongs to Santa Claus, who lives in Canada. I'm here to tell you, Santa Claus lives in Canada. What these examples show us is that if you want your data to be simple, you got to go out and make the world simple, then come back to me. I get lots of comments from time to time from developers and DBAs that I've got too many tables in a database design. That's because they have some sort of fear of having to do a join in their code. It's not really a fear, it's, it's really an irrational phobia, but this is because they believe that all normalization makes code perform slower. But it doesn't, 
because normalization also decreases the size of your data. And we all know decreasing the size of your data means you can return more of it faster. The underlying truth that I want you to know about these problems with data is that they happen because people are weird and systems are weird and people lie. Let's talk about some weird data. So this news came about in 2017 that a teenager had found a flaw in NASA's rocket science data. That particular flaw was that he found that when a certain sensor was being read, when nothing hit it, it returned a negative number. But that energy level can't be negative. Thus, he contacted US Space Agency and it turned out that no one else had noticed. Well, anyone in the data world knows that the reason a non-reading from a sensor returned negative one is because they were using that instead of a null. They were using negative one as what I call a faux null. A faux null puts the, is put in place of an unknown value. The problem with faux nulls is everyone has to be in on this weird little trick to fix the database. This particular 17-year-old wasn't in on that trick. Neither was all the media that just loved the story of a teenager telling NASA experts how to deal with their data. Here's another example of weird data. The envelope on the left is one sent to me by the US government, specifically the State Department, because it was a passport-related correspondence. You can't really tell from the photo, but there's a sticker above my name that just says Care of Canada, which I found very endearing. The key behind it is, though, that the third party mailing facility that the US government uses, specifically the State Department, doesn't support countries in mailing addresses. And therefore, a person or a machine had to go to the extra expense and time and error proneness of putting a sticker on top of the little window. That's kind of weird, given that this particular governmental department is also responsible for overseeing all of our foreign embassies. Another example on the right, same issue. They were unable to add a country to their mailing address software. So they wrote it in pen on the waxy window, and it still got to me. Data is weird. US citizens sometimes live in other countries. Customers sometimes move to other countries just because people are weird. Here's an example of my name. Now, formally, my name has an accent over the O, but this causes all kinds of problems with all kinds of computing systems and sometimes with people. As you can see from my friend who postal mailed me a card, didn't know where the accent went, so he just put it over all the letters. This is the most infamous example of a blogger who also shares the same last name with me, who ended up with a package from UPS that went through so many transformations, he wrote a poem about it because it came up with Lopez spelled with all those extra escapes going on specifically there in our mutual name. Let's talk about why this issue is more than just a funny poem written about a really unfortunate series of events. I think people's names are inherently the most personal pieces of information that we record about someone. That means that we have designed computing systems with constraints that might have been true decades ago. We continue to carry along the wrong sorts of data types, the wrong sorts of code, that ignores the fact that all kinds of people have extra spaces in their names. They have characters that they think are just regular characters that change how their names are pronounced, that change the meaning of their name. We force these people to lie about what their names are in our systems. I never use the accented O when I buy something online, when I order something, when I register for something. I didn't use it when I get my ID because we've all learned those lessons that eventually some system isn't going to be able to find our record or our license isn't legit. It's more than just, you know, supporting extended characters. This is about supporting people's names as they really are. 
So we think about how people are weird, having a special character or an accent or a different spelling or even new characters that go outside the North American data set. Those are important things to people and we're not supporting them. So I'd like you to consider the next time you're thinking about data, maybe we should spell people's names correctly. Because data is weird. If your data and your designs and your specifications and your standards don't account for data being weird or people lying or systems being weird, then you're going to end up with chaotic outcomes. Here's one of my favorite ones. For years, the integration between several different travel sites and airlines appended an A to my first name. My name's Karen. But all of a sudden, on Air Canada, I became Karina, which I called my spy name. And I would even tell TSA they didn't care that my name wasn't spelled the same. They just cared that I had a passport with a name and that they knew that boarding passes often showed incorrect name information. And you can see here from examples with my name being appended with salutations or not having a middle initial or just having an initial for our first name. But you can call me Karina the next time we get together. Systems can be good. The data can be weird and people can lie and systems can be good. But we all know, having to deal with systems, that sometimes systems are just as good as the last person to work on them. But they can lie. For instance, someone shipped something to me. They knew me from Twitter, so they just used my Twitter name and it still showed up. This is one of my favorites. My Starbucks name is Kitty and that's also a nickname I have. But you can see as I give that information to baristas, they have many different interpretations of this word. Kitte, kitty, kitty, spelling it both ways with two D's and two T's, spelling it Kenny, which is just ironic because that's my twin brother's name. In this example, I'm going to talk about how another way systems can lie. So several years ago, I went down to my Bureau of Motor Vehicles to get a new driver's license, and I was most concerned with my driver's license photo because that's how people are. So I stood in line, got my photo taken, hoped for the best, and got my driver's license. I checked out the photo, it was great. So I was happy with it. When I got home and showed my mother my new driver's license, the first thing she noticed was my date of birth was wrong on it. And that was a big problem. So I went back to the Department of Motor Vehicles to get my license reprinted with the correct date of birth on it. And I had my birth certificate, I had all my other ID. But unfortunately, their computer systems can't change the date of birth on anybody's driver's license because if you think about it, it's really odd for the date of your birth to change. I mean, in real life, what would that mean, your date of birth change? You were born again? Well, not quite that way. But in my case, the data was wrong. Someone had typed it in wrong. So instead of the 27th, it was the 7th, and that was wrong. Now, you know, some people might say, why does this matter? Well, of course it matters. This is your ID. I said, we have to be able to change this. So they called their help desk, and the help desk says, well, no one's date of birth can change. And what that said to me was their system had been designed to focus on sort of, we'll call it a real life truth, but your data in a system isn't real life. It's an abstraction of who you are, your name, your address, your height, and your date of birth. They weren't going to let me have that changed. Fortunately, I knew some of the people that worked in this department and they knew I had a twin brother. That's us there. That's me on the left and him on the right. And they, knew that we were twins and therefore probably had either the same date of birth or very similar dates of birth. I was also fortunate that he was a law enforcement officer in this location and I got him to come down and talk to people and say there has to be a way. He's very good at doing that type of stuff. And eventually someone had to override the system and go in and manually update the data. 
which if you know how data integrity works, that's a very awful way of updating data. But all's well that ends well. I got my driver's license with the correct date. Well, it was almost good enough because they made me take my picture again. And of course, that one was horrible. What I learned from this is that systems sometimes are really good at doing bad things. We see this all the time when people implement constraints because they think it will make the data better, only to find out it makes the data worse. The typical example is on e-commerce systems on the web where they do sell to people outside the US. They knew to rename the label from zip code to postal code, but they put a constraint on it that it could only have numbers in it. And in many locations, such as mine, our postal codes have letters and numbers. So maybe the system was lying about my date of birth when someone typed it in wrong, but the fact that they had no provision for updating that data except for a manual error-prone safety concern process was also a problem to data quality. I know you might have some questions now that I've gone through these. And in fact, when I give this in front of a live audience, I often get these questions. Won't artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, quantum computing, or whatever solve all these issues? You see lots of promise of these things. Sure, AI and ML can help people do their jobs more efficiently by taking on sort of the low hanging fruit or the 80% of things and activities that computes good at doing. But the answer is no. People being weird, systems being bad, systems lying, people lying. I don't think that modern technologies or even traditional technologies are gonna fix these problems. These are part of being in the real world and we need to make sure that we have processes in place to deal with these anomalies. The constant pushback I get from DBAs, developers, DevOps people, and storage guys is, what if I don't have time to worry about all those data things? Well, a lot of us don't have time to worry about a whole lot of things. And that's especially true as we're being asked to do so much the tools and the technologies and the innovation that's happening around us is really hard to keep up with. But as my grandmother would say, obviously you have time to fix all the problems afterwards. Thinking about the data we're going to be supporting, designing, or using does require some time, but the payoff for those is really huge. Now the people in the Agile world and some of the DevOps worlds, the Scrum worlds, are going to say, no, no, we can't do thinking first. It's important we just start doing sprints. A lot of infrastructure is data, as I talked about previously, and a lot of DevOps is data. I think it's important that we understand the more data we're producing as part of managing infrastructure, defining infrastructure, deploying infrastructure, the more time we're going to have to spend to make sure that the data that we're using to do these things is properly managed, that it has the right data quality, that we version it just like we version other things, that we control it as much as we control other things. Another question I get is what about cloud technologies? Will cloud technologies fix any of these issues? And the simple answer to that is no. Yes, software as a service can help us work on data quality, can help us secure data, help us monitor it, but in the long run, we're still going to struggle with these data issues that have to do with people lying, systems lying, and people being weird. Ah, the big pushback. Isn't this just a problem with relational databases? I hear this a lot from the NoSQL crowd. Well, some of the issues with relational databases are the reason we have non-relational data so storage solutions. And they're solving a specific problem. But again, the people being weird, that data being weird, the real world being complex, adding more complexity to our solution only makes sense when those solutions are a better fit for our data stories. Usually people get around to this one, so I need a data professional. Well, I'm biased, and I think you do. 
But that data professional doesn't have to be a data architect like me. Perhaps what you need is all IT professionals learning to love their data, to think about their data, to think about their data as a separate component of all the other things they're managing. To treat it just as software means you have data that's biased towards that application. We need to remember that people are weird and that people lie and that systems lie. Why do we need to do this? Well, it's because I want you to be on team data. Team data isn't necessarily just people who work with data all the time, but they're also people who want to make sure that the data they use is treated with respect. If we know that systems lie, then we need to engineer out the lies. If we know that people lie, we need a way of validating the data they gave to us. So it could be that the system is messed with the data. For instance, the integration errors I had while flying. It could be that your data constraints didn't match the real world, such as when I have to give the zip code for Hell, Michigan. It could be that I'm just lying about it because I don't want to give you my real email address. There's all kinds of reasons why our data quality is poor. If you understand that the world is complex, you will allocate enough time to understand those complexities. If you understand that people lie, you'll allocate the time and resources to validate data. If you know that systems lie, you'll allocate the budget to make sure that they stop lying. The data you support and the data that you use deserves your love. That includes security. We all know, for instance, for data protection, we need to make sure we have backups. But as I'm known for saying, we don't actually need backups. What we need are restores. If you're not retesting your restore systems, both your files and your infrastructure and your networking, it doesn't really matter if your backups were going really fast. We also tend to deal with performance as an issue where people propose that data quality and performance are conflicting points of view. But the opposite of data quality isn't slow performance, and the opposite of high performance isn't low data quality. We need to work together on teams to ensure that we're not just moving bad data around faster, and to also make sure that the cost of having good data isn't preventing people from, ex from executing their business processes. Our data also needs integrity. Integrity, which is different than quality, says that when we retrieve a piece of data, it's the value it's supposed to be. So this works together with security, constraints, validations, data profiling, a lot of data activities to ensure that we can trust that data. And then there's data quality, which as I said, is a measure against standards for those things. I wanna thank you so much for spending this time with me while I went through my rants and examples of people lying, systems lying, and the truths about data. Thank you.